We are thankful to be here this morning. Thank you, brother, for the invitation to come. And uh, we praise the Lord for the privilege to uh, preach God's word this morning. We pray that we will receive it as such. I have been assigned the, the, the subject of the Church of Philadelphia and her problems. The Church of Philadelphia and her problems. So if you'll turn with me to Revelation chapter 3, we'll get started. As, as you turn there, uh, I'm sure that you know this. I hope that you know this. I hope that you have, as pastors and preachers, you've preached through the book. I ho hope as church members, you've studied through the book, read through the book yourself, that the book of Revelation is a, is a wonderful book, a wonderful book of, of God's word. But it's essential that we realize something about the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is a book about the future, right? We, we, we can see that if we've read it. But it is a book about the future uh, that is purposed by God to instruct us and encourage our present. It's, it's a very unique book. Yes, it, 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 it is primarily about the future, but it is about the future for our present, for us today. And primarily, it instructs and encourages our present concerning the present living Christ. As was said last night, and as ought to always be said, this book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Sure, we, we see the Antichrist, we see the tribulation period, we see the second coming, we see the future. Yes, we see those things, and this book tells us about those things, but its primary purpose is Christ and what the true, the real, the true, living, present-day Christ should mean to all of us. What he should mean to all of us, especially us as, as his church. Some of the most unique and profound teaching in all of God's word to the church specifically is found in chapter 1, 2, and 3 of this book. So it's important. Let's, let's read chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. This is what he says. I know thy works, Behold, look, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, look, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, look, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So as I mentioned, this book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And you will notice that the address to the church of Philadelphia begins, just as was mentioned last night, but it's important that we see this. It begins exactly as the six, six addresses to the other churches begin, with a very personal, very intimate preface or declaration, revelation from Christ himself concerning Christ himself, which speaks very specifically to, to these churches, each of these churches, and specifically here to the church of Philadelphia. So here in verse 7, Jesus describes himself as the Holy One. In this address, the addresser describes himself as the Holy and True One. In other words, he is holy. He is other. He is other than any other. 
He is the one-of-a-kind, unique one. The one-of-a-kind, unique, true, or authentic one. That's who he is. That's who this addresser is. Look, in verse 7, the one, he is the one that, that has the keys of David. Now, what's that? Well, on the surface, we can see that he is the one that holds the keys to the kingdom. Do you hear that? He is the one, this one-of-a-kind, authentic one, this other one, he is the one who holds the keys to the kingdom. Now, I'm sure that some of our minds are probably going back to Matthew 16, 19, where, where he tells us, Christ himself tells his church there that he is giving them the keys to the kingdom. Well, church, yes, he has given us the keys to the kingdom, the oversight, the, the management to the kingdom. If I could put it like this, if, a, if an owner of a business has a manager, one of the first things he does with that manager when he hires that manager is give, gives him a key, the keys to the shop, right? Right? That's what Christ is talking about with these keys. But he's telling us something here. Yes, he has given us, given us as overseers of, of, or managers, church or churches, uh, of his kingdom, but he has the master set. He has the master set. This Jesus, this one-of-a-kind, authentic one, he owns the master set of the keys to his kingdom. By the way, let me add just a little sidebar here. Let's, let's make sure we all realize that there is a distinction between the church and the kingdom. There is a distinction between the church and the kingdom. The Lord's church is a wonderful institution. And what a glorious blessing it is to be a, a part of, of, of this glorious institution of, of the Lord's church. It is second only to salvation itself. This blessing that has been given to us, this blessing that do, we, do not, we, do not, we, we do not have a right to it of ourselves. It has been given freely to us by His grace. If you are a member of the Lord's church, the Lord Himself has given you that blessing freely, just like He gave you the blessing of salvation freely. It's not of you. It's actually in spite of you. It's because of Him. It's because of this one-of-a-kind, authentic Christ. It's because of Him. But with that said, let us also remember, let's not forget that there's also the kingdom of God at large to consider. There is. I mean, if I could say it like this, we will be sure to fault, and rightly so, did you hear that? And rightly so, we will be sure to fault those that hold to the idea of the universal invisible church. You know what their issue is? They do not see the distinction between the kingdom and the church. That's what the issue is, and we will be, we will be right, right to fault them at that, but let's not get derailed off the other side of the track and forget that there is also the kingdom. There is also church and churches. There is also the work of the kingdom as well. Because church, we absolutely have a responsibility. We absolutely have a duty to God's kingdom at large. That's what those keys that he's given to us, to his kingdom, are all about. Our responsibility and our duty to the kingdom that is in this world, the kingdom of God at large. But notice more specifically to this opening address, the words of Jesus here in verse 7, I'm he that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. That's actually an inference to Isaiah 22, 22, which is a prophecy and an allusion to the Messiah himself. So Jesus is saying here in this address, that he is the, the one, unique, authentic, true Messiah. That's who Jesus is. He is the Messiah. He is the long prophesied, long awaited Messiah. That's who he is, church. That is who our head is, the Messiah. He's the true Christ of God. In other words, he is the king. That's who our head is. He is the king. He is the king of time and eternity. He is the king, listen, he is the king of the kingdom of God. That's who he is. That's who this Christ is. That's who he's showing this church and us through this church here that he is. That's who he is. Notice in, in verse 8 then, 
He says, I know thy works. So this king, our king, he is the one that knows. He is the one who knows all about this church of Philadelphia. He is the one who knows all and anything about all of his other churches. He knows us inside and outside. Those fiery eyes of omniscience in chapter 1, those churches, they ser he, he searches us out. In perfect omniscience, he knows everything about us. He knows not only what we're doing, he knows why we're doing it. He knows not only what we're not doing, he knows why we're not doing it. He knows everything there is to know about us. That's who this Christ is. So we see the, the Christ of the addresser, or really we see the addresser. And then as, as is true with most of the other churches as well, the intimate address here is then followed by accolades. It is followed by praises. And this church, the Church of Philadelphia, has a long list of accolades. A long list. Let me just list them for us quickly. There in first, first in verse 8, he knows, but what, what does he know? He knows their works. This church is a working church. It's a working church. And you'll notice they have been given uh, by the one who opens and closes, by the one who opens, they have been given an open door of ministry into the kingdom of God. That's what it says there. And then you'll notice that they have strength. That's a wonderful thing to have strength, right? But I'll, I'll, you, you can see it here. They have micros dunamos. That's what they have, little strength. Micros dunamos. If I could picture it, because it is a very uh, pictorial language here, they're not a bomb that destroys everything, good and bad, in its wake. They're not that, but also they're not a sparkler. That's only good for looking at. All right? They're in the middle. They're a little dynamite. They're a little dynamite. So you think about that. Is, that. is that an accolade or is that admonition? Well, we should know, church, that if we have any power, if we have any, any strength, any ability at all, it's little. That's the, that's the reality of us. But, hey, listen, I'll take being a little dynamite. I'll take that. And then this church is using that little strength notice to keep. That word means to, to guard, to observe, to follow. He says the, the word of Christ, my word. What's that? The book. They didn't have the church of Philadelphia, didn't have all that we have, but that's what he's talking about. He, he's talking about the book, God's word. And then you'll notice because that's the only way that they and we can, any church can, make sure that they do not deny Christ. Listen, if we do not follow this book, we can say everything we want to say about us and who we are and everything else. If we do not follow this book, we will deny Christ. If there's one thing that we can learn from the ensembles of the Old Testament is that they had a, had a, had a severe inclination to idolatry. We'll make I idols out of anything. We better follow the book. The book. Not what we think about the book, but what the book actually says. Not tradition, but the book. That's what's going to keep us from denying Christ. That's what this church was doing with their, in their little strength. They were keeping, observing the book. Well, then verse 9. Verse 9 is a complicated verse, but it may not say what you think it says. One of the things that is saying that we may not understand at first glance is that this church, the Church of Philadelphia, is a teaching church. This is, is a teaching posture here. It's a teaching church, and what they teach causes others to come and worship, listen, come and worship God. If you think that verse, verse 9, is saying that, that people are going to come and worship the church, that is not, that is not what that verse is saying. There is only one who is worthy of worship, and we've already seen him in, in the beginning in the address. We've already seen him, and he's sure not going to lead someone, the one who is worthy of worship and knows that he is worthy of worship, and the only one worthy of worship. He's not going to lead someone to worship something else, even if it's his church. If you go back to Ephesians 5 and you draw that picture out, of Christ and his church, and then related into marriage, husbands, if you worship your wife, 
you're worshiping an idol. So if Christ is worshiping his church, he's worshiping an idol. If he's bringing others to worship his church, he's worshiping, he's bringing others to worship an idol. He's not going to do that. We better not either. No, he is bringing them to this church to be taught. <laughs> to be taught, and at the, at the same time, those people now that are called in this text, the synagogue of Satan, those people are shown by this church by what they teach, that they, this church, is loved by Christ. You get a hold of that. And think about this. Think about this. I want to ask you, how do others know that God loves us? How do others know that God loves us? Well, first and foremost, they know that God loves us because we love him. That's how. That'll give you some idea of what this church was teaching. That Christ brought this, these, this group from the synagogue of Satan into the church of Philadelphia so that they could learn through what they taught to worship God. You know what this church of Philadelphia was teaching? Christ saturated. Christ filled truth. They weren't preaching themselves. Their focus was Christ. Their, their center, the center of their teaching was Christ. The center of their doctrine was Christ. Christ-centric preaching. Christ-centric teaching. That's what was going on in this church of Philadelphia. Verse 10 it says here in this accolade that this church kept or is keeping the word sayings of, notice, my. So Christ is talking, right? So this, this church is keeping the, the word of Christ's patience. This is an accolade that, that he gives them, a very important accolade. We'd be, we'd be well served to, to know and learn and find out and practice what he's, he's talking about here. So what is what is the word of Christ's patience. Well, it's this. James 5, verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman, who is the, in a, an allusion of God himself in this text, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and he hath long patience for it. There's Christ's patience. He has long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth near. So, so this church, the church of Philadelphia, was, was working in the kingdom, teaching the book, loving Christ, and waiting patiently. It only makes sense if they really love him. Waiting patiently for his return. That's what they were keeping, the word of his patience. They knew that he, he would keep his word. They knew that he, would, he is faithful to his word. They knew, they believed, they expected him to come. That's what that accolade's all about. Now that's a, quite a list of accolades, isn't it? Well, we would own some of those. Well, hang on. Because here he goes, Christ goes from accolades right into a list of affirmations. A list of encouragement. Verse 10, because they are faithfully waiting, looking, expecting the return of Christ, Christ is going to keep them, guard, that word keep means to guard or, guard or reserve them. Notice the preposition, from. The word from means out of or away from. And then notice, not just temptation. It doesn't say he's going to keep them from temptation, but the hour, the period of temptation. And it, then, it's, then it's described here as, as the period of temptation that will come upon the whole world to try them. The Bible only knows one event that fits that description. And that is the tribulation period. It's pretty clear what the king is saying here, isn't it? Verse 11, he goes on, more affirmation. He says, hold fast, church, and hold fast and you will get a crown. Is that what it says? No. It says, hold on, church, you already have a crown. You know that? You can't lose what you don't already have. Hold on. Continue in the faith. Continue in the true faith. Continue in the book. Abide in this Christ. Press for the mark and you will receive your crown. You will receive it. You will re receive your Stephanos, your, your crown of reward. 
you will receive it. Verse 12, and you who overcomes, you who continues to the end, look at verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. I don't have time to even begin to pick it all out here, but this verse in one sentence speaks of position and permanence as the possession of God himself. Notice who's, what God it is. What God is it? Christ says, my God. What God is Christ's God? What God is the God of the true, authentic, real Christ? The true, authentic, real God. The one true and only living God of heaven and earth. He's telling us here we will have position with him. We will have permanence with him. We are, church, his possession, or the church of Philadelphia here is. And maybe the most wonderful thing is found in that last clause. Here Jesus, this one-of-a-kind, authentic Christ, says to this, the, this church and overcoming churches, he says, I will write upon him my new name. In other words, everything that we think we know about Christ Jesus, his name, that's not J-E-S-U-S, okay? That's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about his reputation. Our perception of him that we hold in our minds, really God's perception of him when he holds him in his mind. That's his name. But, but ours, because he's talking to the, this church, our possession, per perception of Christ that we hold in our minds, here it is, is going to be completely redefined. Everything that we think we know about this one-of-a-kind, unique, authentic one is going to be completely redefined. It's going to be completely renewed when we see him as he is. Listen, here's what this is really saying. He is so much more than anything we can comprehend about him. He is so much more. But soon when we are with him and soon when the blinders of our flesh and our sin have been taken away, we are going to see him anew. And he is going to write upon our minds his new name, this reality, his true reality. Then and there, when we see him as he is, that sight, when he writes his true reality upon our mind, that sight will captivate our entire being and our entire eternity forever and ever and ever. We'll not be able to take our eyes off of him again. He is so much more than we can comprehend. Wow, what accolades, what affirmation. In the words of a great theologian, holy smokes, Batman. And then Christ concludes in verse 13, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. But wait a minute, something is missing. We've seen the address, we've seen the long list of accolades, even the glorious affirmation, but where is the admonition? I mean, all the other churches except for one, Smyrna, the Lord greatly admonished them and greatly even condemned them. And actually, if you begin in chapter 2 and follow the list, they just get worse and worse. Worse and worse. I mean, this church, Philadelphia, sits between the dead church and the one that wants to, the one that makes the Lord want to throw up. That's where they sit. Right in the middle of that. They sure do. This church sits here for us right in the middle of that like a beautiful, glorious diamond on a black background. In other words, this is on purpose. This is on purpose, God's purpose, because he wants us, he intends for us to see this church, he intends for us to see Philadelphia in the midst of this great contrast around her and say this, this church, 
not the dead church, not the sickening church. This church is what we want to be. This church is what we must be like. That's what he wants us to see. Well, church and churches, there's good news. We can be like this church. By God's grace, we can own the accolades, we can own the affirmations, we can know the addresser in this most intimate way. And here is how. It's actually right here in the text. It's actually at the front of the text. So we know there are no coincidences in God's word, right? It is no coincidence that this church was the church that it was. It is no coincidence that this letter was written to this church. It was no coincidence that this church is where it is in the route of the postman. It's no coincidence. So if we want to own these accolades and these affirmations from Christ himself, then we need to become like this church. We need to become like Philadelphia Baptist Church. The word Philadelphia is an actual Greek word, which is an anomaly in itself. And this same Greek word is actually found seven, seven other times in the New Testament. But in every other instance, it is actually translated instead of using the actual Greek word. Philo or phileo means love. Adelphia means brother. So if we want to be like this church, if we want to own the accolades and the affirmations, we need to be brotherly love Baptist church. And it's just that simple. We need to be brotherly, brotherly love Baptist church. Because remember, churches, that whatever we may be or whatever we may do, without love, without Philadelphia, without Philadelphia, 1 Corinthians 13, we're just a bunch of useless noise. Whatever we may think of ourselves, however great and whatever esteem we may raise us up on, without love, without Philadelphia, we are nothing but useless noise. Remember, church, of whatever we may, may be, with, without love, it is, it is through love, it is through Philadelphia that all will know that we are the true disciples of Christ. And therefore, the true churches of Christ, of all the lists that we may build and, and check our list of what we own and what we do, if we do not have Philadelphia, we're nothing. If we do not have Philadelphia, no one will know that we are the church of Jesus Christ. It is through Philadelphia that all will know that Christ loves us. Remember? They came, they sat before their feet, and they were taught. And they realized, hey, Christ loves that church. What, did it, what were they being taught, Philadelphia? Philadelphia, that's what they were being taught. That's what they were experiencing from this church, Philadelphia. Brotherly love. <laughs> it's through love. And, and here's the thing, we can actually see what the brotherly love Baptist church, what that means right here in the text. Here it is. Let me go through it quickly because I'm running out of time. We need a love like this church that works in and, and, and builds the kingdom of the one true Christ. We need, we need to be a church like Philadelphia that works in and builds the, works in to build the kingdom of the one true Christ. How they do that? They declared and demonstrated him, their king, Christ, the Christ of his word. That's the reason that, that's what they were keeping in his word. That's the reason they did not deny Christ. They did not deny his word. And Christ is his word. And his word is Christ. And they declared and demonstrated him through the open door of God-given ministry. They exerted their little strength, but they exerted themselves in the keeping and teaching of the book in the teaching and the keeping of, of the whole counsel of God. In other words, they were hearers, they were students, they were doers of the book. Not a bunch of fluff, not a bunch of add-ons, not a bunch of tradition, just the book. They knew the book, they believed the book, they kept the book, they demonstrated the book, they walked in the book, they lived in the book. That's what Brotherly Love Baptist Church, that's what it is to be Brotherly Love Baptist Church. And they did this, listen, they did this, and we must do this if we're going to be like Brotherly Love Baptist Church. 
We must do this not to just the people who think like us and look like us and act like us, but to all kinds of people everywhere. In other words, we don't shut the doors. They've been given an open door. The one who opens and no man shuts, open the door. We don't shut the door. We don't shut the door to have our meetings. We don't shut the door with what happens at the meeting. It's open. We, we don't... We don't we don't villainize everyone else because they don't look like us and think like us and, and act like us. You know what everyone else needs? They need the book. They need the truth of God's Word. We say that we have all the truth. Guess what? They need it. They need it. And listen, if you love the truth, if you really love the truth and not just you, if you really love the truth, you know what you do with the truth? If you really love the truth, like Brotherly Love Baptist Church, you go with the truth and you tell the truth. You declare the truth. You sound it from the rooftops because it is the truth that you love. Listen, I understand. We all should understand that there are enemies of the gospel. There are enemies of the gospel, and we need to expose the enemies of the gospel. But there are those that also know the true gospel and love the true gospel who don't understand the other truths of God's Word. How will they believe if they do not hear? How will they believe if we shut the doors and we just have our meetings and nothing happens after the meeting? How will they believe if, if they do not hear? Listen, brothers and sisters, we need balance. If we will be followers and disciples of Jesus Christ, He was the most balanced man that ever walked the face of the earth. Do we realize that? He was the most balanced man that ever walked the face of the earth. He exposed his enemies. Yes, he exposed his enemies. And then he wept for those that were under their tutelage. He, 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 <laughs> he loved his church. He founded his church. He died for his church. But then he also said, those that are not against us are for us. We need, we need balance. We are to be going through the open doors of ministry into this world to build the kingdom of God. You know, I bet that Saul was thankful that Ananias understood that. And I, I bet that Apollos was thankful that Aquila and Priscilla understood that. And I bet the Athenians we're thankful that the Apostle Paul under, understood that. And I bet if we would really just think about it, the truth, we would be thankful that Jesus understood that about us. Because he came to us when we didn't think like him, act like him, look like him. But he came to us anyway. And you know what he, what he taught us? His word. He sent somebody to us to tell us the truth of his word. And we didn't know anything. But we do now. Because he didn't shut the doors of his word. He came to us, saved us, taught us his word. In the words of the great theologian, let that mind be in you, which is also in Christ.